find out he taught at Hampton. And great, thank you, Zoom. So um, his, one of his students was Charles Flax. One of Charles Flax's students was Roland Carter, who is um, a living legend, who is one of the foremost authorities on the spiritual. Like his life has been on the spiritual. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people who do a lot of work in the spiritual but very few of them can say that they've been doing it since they were like a teenager. Um, so Roland Carter was one of Charles Flax's students. Well, one of his students was Roizel Dillard, who was my teacher. And Hampton has kept that tradition of having Art Nathaniel Death's music in their repertoire, like always, because the music is just that good. But to give you a little context about why he wrote some of the music that he did, and, and most of what we'll talk about tonight really goes in, uh, fits into this is Det, being an educated man, he saw that there were two different groups of, of Black musicians during his life. You had those who did, for whatever reasons, didn't go to college, didn't get any additional education. And when they were going to their Christian churches, they tended to perform spirituals or things that were closely related to spirituals. Those denominations are more of our uh, Pentecostal ones. So if you've ever been to a Pentecostal black church or a Pentecostal white church, let's be very clear, Pentecostal churches, no matter how they identify, they pretty much are all the same. There's very rarely a quiet moment that's going to happen. There's very rarely gonna be a moment where most people are sitting down. There's a lot of stuff that happens. And I was raised this way. I love Pentecostal church. I miss it sometimes, oh gosh. So I watch videos every now and then to make me uh, remember those. But you had a group that they appreciated those. Well, you then had another group around the turn of the century who were fortunate enough to be able to go to one of the few schools that allowed Black people to study there. And as they learned a little bit more, they said, hmm, we don't really want to do spirituals. They remind us of slavery from our parents and grandparents. And that music is kind of like a low class. Well, we're going to these Episcopal, Anglican, Methodist churches where they're doing hymns and anthems and motets. Well, Dent, seeing that conversation that's happening, he's like, okay, what am I gonna do? Spirituals are too good. This folk music is too great. Like Dvorak said, if you're going to create that American sound, go to the Negro spirituals and the Native American melodies. And Dent was like, I wanna do that, but I also wanna write this, as he called, best ch class of church music that everybody else wants to hear. So he's like, hmm, what can I do? So as he was in school, uh, he went to Oberlin, was the first student to graduate, first black student to graduate double degree in piano and composition. And he was like, hmm, okay, I'm at this recital. The Niesel String Quartet is playing this work by Dvorak. This melody reminds me of a song that my grandmother used to sing. And in one of uh, the things that he wrote, he said, like, it reminded him of the sweet, frail voice of his dear departed grandmother. And it came back to him. And suddenly he was like, oh, wow, I now get it. And then while, and still while he was at school, he was working on um, Go Down Moses. And he had written something that kind of worked like that. And then later on in his life, he used that, created a fugue um, based on Go Down Moses. But with all of that, he was like, okay, I can combine these spirituals or this folk music with these hymns, anthems, and motets, put it together and create an amazing thing. And so that's what he did. And it's not like he was really innovative. He was innovative with the use of Black folk music, but we know plenty of other composers who have done that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, one of the biggest, greatest, most prolific composers, he's like at the top. And, you know, I'm starting to appreciate his music more and more, is by a man by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. We know that he used Lutheran chorales all the time. Like, you just, you couldn't get away from it, dealing with him. And Det decided to do pretty much the same thing with this music, and it's fantastic. So in your packet tonight, we have six pieces um, and we'll sing through. You'll have the opportunity on mute. Um, so this is a nice time to you know, do the good Zoom checks and make sure you're on mute. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to go through. We'll ha I'll have play recordings of these. One of them I literally just found 30 minutes ago. Um, and I was like, oh, yay. 
Um, and one of them, the very last piece in the packet, <clears throat> we will actually, I created a score moving video. I don't know what you call those things, but I created one with my choir because we just performed it for uh, literally for this video. Um, so we'll, you won't have to worry about uh, flipping through the PDF for that. So um, yeah, we'll get through most of the song. I mean, we'll go sing through most of the songs. One of them will cut a little bit short, but it's good for you to just experience that. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So without further ado, I think we are ready for Listen to the Lambs. So um, we'll start off with that one. Listen to the Lambs is, I'll say his most famous piece. So many people have performed it before and it is, let's see, doo -doo, I'm making sure I got my, yeah, computer sound, great. So Listen to the Lambs published in 1914 for Eight Park Choir. There are versions of debt for uh, Soprano Alto Choir and for SATB with no Debussy. But then another person did an arrangement for uh, tenor tenor bass bass, another did it for SAB. So there are quite a few. Now the only one that's in the public domain is the eight part version. So if you want to do the other versions, you got to still pay Shermer for those. And I think you can like, get some of them from Pepper. Now, the score that you see is not one of my editions because I just haven't gotten to this one yet. Um, I will. I literally have a chart for all of Art Nathaniel Dett's choral music when it goes into the public domain. And I'm, the goal is to release two of my editions every year. So I will be working on those. Speaking of, why not? I'm gonna go ahead and show this to you. I do have it up. Great. Share screen, basic, Firefox. There we go. Do you see it? Thumbs up? Great. So you go to my website, mlagmusic.com. If you click the research tab, then you can click Choral Music of Art Nathaniel Jett. A nice picture of him, a little description. This is at the end of all of my editions, these two paragraphs. Um, and then you will see eight scores that I have edited. All of these scores are in the public domain, a very small description. And as people send me recordings, I'll put them down there. Woohoo! So, you know, if you want to record something, send it to me. I would love to put it down here so more people can hear it. And this is kind of like a one stop shop for his public domain uh, music. So you can go to this site, download these, print as many copies as you want, share it with any and everybody. I am not charging a dime for it. I won't even accept any money. Now you can pay me to talk about this stuff, but I'm not paying for, don't pay me for the additions. Do not. I tell folks that Art Nathaniel Debt is the reason that I have my job because I did my dissertation on him and I wouldn't have been able to get this job here had I not written that. That was made very clear on multiple occasions. Are you finished that dissertation yet? Like literally the director of School of Music, the PR uh, person and one other faculty member watched my defense just to make sure that it happened. He was like, just call me after it's done. I got you. He's like, all right, you're good to go. We can hire you. So um, yeah, and you can actually download my dissertation if you feel like reading even more nerdy stuff about this, um, then yeah, do that. All right, so let's get to, let's listen to the lamb, getting back to that. This is a work that is, as you see at the top, a religious characteristic in the form of an anthem. Remember, his goal was to make church music based on spiritual. So what did he do? He took this spiritual that is kind of long. It's got quite a few verses, got some call and response and stuff. He literally took two measures, count it, one, two, two measures and made a 100 measure work out of it. But how did he do that? He used some of the call and response elements. If you look at the first page, sopranos and altos, listen to the lambs, tenors and bass, all are crying. Listen to the lambs. He changed it up. Oh, it's just so good. Listen to the lamb. He keeps changing up the response. They're going to say that response again and again. The only thing is, you never know what they're crying. Now, in the original spiritual, they cry, I want to go to heaven when I die. Okay. He took that part out. And if you get over to page five, no, not page five, page four, you'll see the B section. A section is in D minor, all choir. B section has our soprano solo. Now, look at that melody. You see how many notes? Five notes. We call that what? Pentatonic scale. I'm so glad that y'all have learned something. What he did was make a connection to the spiritual. We know quite a few spirituals are use of pentatonic melodies. 
So he made his own pentatonic melody using the text from Isaiah 40, 11. He shall feed his flock like a, uh, like a shepherd and carry the young lamb in his bosom. Listen to the lambs, flock and lambs. You see how they go together? If you're going to do something for church, you got to use something from the Bible, usually. You know, I mean, uh, some of our contemporary churches, you know, they expand and that kind of stuff. And we're okay with that. Well, nobody's judging how people write their church music. Um, but he did that. And then we'll get back to the end. He brings the spiritual back. I like the whole numbers. Like, I'm just that kind of guy. 100 measures. Great. All right, let's turn back to the first page. We're going to sing along with the Art of Daniel Debt Chorale. I can't hear it, Marcus. I, you, maybe you're muted. And oh, no. OK, let's fix that. Oh, because share sound wasn't on. That's why. Share. Thank you so much. Let's try this again.
All right, got your amen. It works for church. Man, that's just, oh, how many of you in here have sung that already or conducted it? Oh, wow. Okay, so this is something that needs to be in everyone's repertoire. It needs to be. It is one of three pieces in Ray Robinson's Norton Anthology on choral music. One of three pieces by a Black composer. I think the second was probably Dawson, Balm, and Gilead. And then the third is like Hale Smith, some really experimental people. So yeah, we've got those things. Um, yeah, so it's good. All right, next up, America the Beautiful. So this piece was published in 1918. It's actually the reason why I started doing these editions because it was in the, since it was already in the public domain, I put the whole thing in my dissertation, 16 measures, like why not, no need to like excerpt. <laughs> from 16 Measures. And Michael Murphy, who was down in Texas, don't ask me where Alex can put in the chat. I know he knows where Michael Murphy is. And he tagged me in a post on Facebook saying, hey, I learned this piece from Marcus Garrett. And I was like, how do you learn about it? Oh, that would be how. And he used it for his conducting classes. And he said, you got so many things that you can teach about phrasing, about voice leading, blah, 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 blah. Cool, anything you say that's positive about Arne Nathaniel, that's choral music, I support. And I said, hmm, now people probably don't know where to get this. Oh, but if I create additions and put them on my website, then they will know what to do. So that was the first one. And then in like three weeks, I did like five others. And uh, my boyfriend was like, um, you know, you got other things you, you like have to do that you have like deadlines for that. And this is not one of those things. So maybe you should like figure out some other time to do all the other ones. I was like, you're smart. This is why we're together. Anyway, so um, it uses the very familiar text by Catherine Lee Bates. Like we've sung the regular America the Beautiful, but she or the publisher, whoever it was on the score, said by permission. So uh, I'll say that she said that it was okay for him to go ahead and set it. Very simple, strophic. I added some stuff. And in my editions, you can always go to the last page to see what I added to it. I didn't feel like putting all the stuff in parentheses. That was going to be too much work. It's just easier to type it out. And most people just go ahead and do the stuff that's in the parentheses anyway, so why waste my time? All right, so we're just going to sing through the first verse. The group that we're going to listen to is actually a high school group. Um, and yeah, let's just go ahead and sing America the Beautiful. Oh, crap. I'm, I'm Jonathan Harvey, right. music director of the Brattleboro Council for Watching. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited that you know if you caught any of the inauguration i would think that if you happen to go ahead and pre-order amanda gorman's uh poetry that you, you know by the time that comes out you might be able to like have somebody read her poem and then do this piece i think that would be a fantastic transfer from an old black person to a young black person all right next up we have don't be weary traveler this is an amazing work. I'm only going to talk about it for two minutes. He won the Francis Boot Prize for this in 1920 at Harvard. Now, if you know anything about the U.S., while Harvard did allow some Black folks to go there, things weren't always that great. Well, Dent won a few prizes while he was at Harvard. He was there for a year, from 1920 to 1921. And he won a musical prize for this, and he won an essay prize. Um, for uh, another work, uh, for an essay that he wrote, obviously. And for one of those, he, when they found out that he was Black, they made him split the prize with a second place person and named that person another um, winner. Yeah, exactly, Alex, that's exactly how I feel. Uh, but just, it, it was the time, not that we're excusing it, but we understand why. Well, Harvard 
has never, according to their records, they have not been able to find a single program where they have ever performed this prize winning work. Well, apparently they're going to be doing it very soon. So, you know, when I found that out last week, Monday, I sent a message to the DCA said, mm, guess what I heard y'all did y'all about to do this and maybe you don't know my dissertation, da, 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 da. And so, yeah, I was just so excited to hear that. And they got some other, like a mini documentary they're thinking about making. That's not public knowledge, so we're just gonna keep that um, in here, even with the recording, fine, whatever. It's public domain music, so anybody can do it. Um, and uh, Peabody, Institute is going to be doing this piece because it was um, dedicated to the Honorable George Peabody. So they've got their own connection. And this work is a motet. And for debt, a motet was something that had a lot of um, imitation, a lot of moving lines. And you're going to see a ton of that in here. You're going to see the soprano, the two sopranos and alto sing something, tennis and bass has got some. And there's a lot of that. But we're creating church music. So what did he do? He's going to have an amen in there. It's not going to be at the end. Because, you know, you switch things up every now and then. Let it be so. It doesn't have to just be at the end. You can let it be so and then keep saying some more things. I do that all the time. Um, but then also he took uh, a text from Matthew. It's, um, um, all ye that labor, come unto me uh, that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Don't be weary, traveler. Come to me. I'll give you rest. This man was good. He was good. I don't know if he really knew his Bible. He at least knew how to find the right scriptures to make things uh, connect. So we'll listen to the Debt Chorale sing this one as well while we sing along. And I'll go back. To
Yeah, another fantastic one. Um, in the chat, really quickly, tell me what you noticed about this piece or any of the pieces so far. Have you found any things that are similar? Yeah, he loves counterpoint. What else? I know Emma's got something to say because Emma has been singing. I've been, I mean, Emma has been in it. And I love it. I love it. It's good. Keep it up. All right. Alex is not the only one who knows. Like, what have you experienced? Come on, y'all. What have you noticed? Anything with, okay, yeah, sharks. Sure. Reminded me of Bach chorales. Cool. What about, um, what about vocal ranges? Anything specific with uh, his use of counterpoint? Are there any compositional devices that you've known? Yeah, pretty wide vocal ranges. You get to use your full voice. I've been singing alto, and alto's got down to, I think, a low G sharp, and we also had to sing up to a high C, sh C sharp, I think was the other. Yeah, you get a lot. Thick texture similar to Burley's choral music. Great, Rod. Pieces of multi section. Yeah. He did do that quite frequently. And he loves, you saw the imitation throughout, um, especially the Fugato at the end. We traveler, we travel. Yeah. So let's see. Um, how many of you in the room are students? Cool. All right. So, or recent students, what would you say about how, um, if we're talking about a fugue, you know, you got to have your subject and then you have your answer. At what interval typically is the answer going to be? We know that it changes every now and then depending on how we started off, but yeah. Ooh, I, oh, I, Crystal, I love what you said about fake endings. Yeah, good, at the fifth. Did you see that we travel deep? Since it was a sixth, we didn't have to answer it with the fourth. He answered it with, at, starting at the fifth, and then went up and up and said, it's just great. We're going to experience that uh, one more time. And it's in my favorite piece of his. That's at the very end. All right, great. So let's keep going. Weeping Mary. This is one that, uh, that Alex Favaza has. He, he likes this one. Not as much as Wasn't That a Mighty Day, but that one won't go public with me for quite some time. So I couldn't put that one in here. But we'll only listen to a little bit of this one. He takes this uh, spiritual, and you'll see it mostly in the melody. It's a very unique melody in the, um, that it uses both the raised and lowered third. Um, not as much as you, don't you? <laughs> yeah, don't you know what Mary is amazing. Oh, oh. Ah, yeah, I think I'm going to plan. I think I'm going to with chamber singers coming up just so we can get a good recording out of that one. But anyway, topic for another day. Um, is there anybody here like weeping Mary? But then he also, it also has the raise forth. Call upon your G. Oh, it's so good. And Emma got all the way up to that, um, raise six. I love it. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to call on you, Emma, anymore. I promise. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, this is one that is not performed that frequently, probably because it's been out of print for so long. So um, in the coming months or years, I don't know when it's in my schedule to release an edition of this. Hopefully more people will do it and somebody will be like, yeah, I want to do the first recording of that for your website. Cool. All right, so we'll just listen to and sing through. I should stop saying just listen. A little bit of this one. what happened to the sound? I paused it because I wanted to talk to you real quick. So let's look at the top of that page. Everybody look at the alto solo line. Hey, Eleanor. Oh. Um, so uh, look at that alto solo line. Is there anybody here? You see that descending half step? One thing that you are going to find in every one of his pieces is a line that has descending half steps, usually for quite a bit. It's going to happen. So look out for it. Who knows the next time it's going to come up? It might be in this piece. It might not. All right, let's keep going. Call upon your Jesus and Yeah. 
Oh, we got to stop there because we got more songs that we're going to go through. But this one is one of his most syllabic and um, songs and one that has the most of the disjunct um, vocal writing. I mean, yeah, so, you know, you might be able to take little sections of this and be like, all right, sight reading time, make it happen. This will be a good one every now and then. Okay, let's keep going. Gently, Lord, oh, gently lead us. This is one of my favorite pieces by him. And it's because he just does so much fantastic stuff in this. And also you got the fugato at the end. I love imitation. I freaking love it, especially if it's going to be in the form of a fugue. Uh, oh, no, 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 that's not this one. So sorry. I was thinking Son of Mary because something just popped up that says Son of Mary. Sorry. It does not have that in here. What he did with this one is he used a Bahamian folk tune called Dig My Grave Long and Narrow, and he augmented the rhythm. He also lowered it by a minor third because it was like really hot. And then he just added his own counterpoint underneath it. And so you're going to see the lines just going to go in and out. And you can pretty much figure out where the cantus firmus is. And that's what he talks about. This piece he uses the cantus firmus. Another one is his Let Us Cheer the Weary Traveler, which is on my website. You'll see the same thing. Let us cheer the wit. And it's just going to keep happening. Oh, it's great. Um, with this one, so he changed, instead of using that uh, folk text, he then took a text from Thomas Hastings. All right, let's just do it. They don't have anything to do with each other. So there was not that connection like we saw with other pieces. It was just a text that fits this. And so you'll see, and mostly it's in the soprano, but uh, you'll see it in the tenor every now and then. This recording is by a church up in Canada. I got an email one week. He said, hey, we're doing your gently Lord, your edition of Gently Lord of Gently Leaders. We love our Nathaniel Dead. He's like a hometown guy. We love Canadian composers. I'll let them claim him, even though he lives in the U.S. a little bit longer, but it's totally fine. I'll be nice. <laughs> but um, yeah, they did a fantastic job with this. And I was so glad that they let me know about the service so I could watch that. I shared that with Alex and he was just like, yeah, they sing. They sing. And for those that don't know, that means that they sing well. <laughs> if you don't understand that jargon. All right, uh, gently Lord.
going to leave you on that good half cadence. Yeah. <laughs> because he does a lot of the, uh, this next few, like 16 measures are the same as before. And he's got what? An amen at the end. <laughs> Don't forget it's for church. All right. So our last piece, hopefully this video will work. I think it is. Great. Okay, cool. Um, got a little error message earlier. So the last piece, Son of Mary, you can either follow along in on the PDF or you can just look at the screen. I'm going to do a screen share and you'll be able to follow along, make it easy. No worry about tapping. Um, this one uses two melodies from his personal collection and a, a text by Henry Hart Millman. Um, when our heads are bowed with woe, when our bitter tears overflow, when our when we mourn the loss of the dear Jesus, Son of Mary, here, and you're going to see what you probably experienced in the previous piece. Some similar material is going to come back. One of the th good things about our Nathaniel Death music, for the most part, is he brings stuff back which makes the rehearsal process so much easier for us as conductors. And I don't know if it's because so many spirituals and folk tunes just have a lot of repetition in them, or it could have been because while he was at Hampton Institute, the choir did a lot of traveling. And a lot of historically black colleges are known for that, especially in the spring semester. When I taught at a historically black college in um, Pennsylvania, it was one spring semester where my choir, I just want you to guess, how many performances do you think we had in that one semester, spring of 2013? Just put it in the chat. I just want to see what you say. What do you think would be like an impressive number of performances? 18, 15, 53. Crystal, you are funny. <laughs> 20. Okay, we had, but Crystal, you, I would say you're the closest because we actually had 35. <laughs> We did 35 performances in one semester. I should just put one. One semester. Yeah. And so you got to have some stuff that you can like throw in really quickly. They can learn. And we did everything memorized. So now we pulled some stuff from the fall semester to help with that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, that could have been one of the reasons he did this. So yeah, <laughs> yes, it is backwards. So let me go ahead and do a script, share screen for this video. And let's go.
big ups to the UNL Chamber Singers, um, which is where I teach, for those who don't know, I'm at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and they literally learned that in three days. We recorded that um, three rehearsals after our concert. And we had not looked at that. I literally gave it to them the day before. I was like, all right, sectionals real quick, come together. All right, let's work on it. Come back, just did another rehearsal and then we recorded it. Yeah, they pulled that together. They work hard. But as one of my students said after, they were like, you know, the song is like, really, it's actually not that difficult. And we could have memorized the whole thing if we had like one more rehearsal. They were like, yeah, we could have done it. I was like, oh, maybe I'll know that going forward. Now, some of you might have been like, well, what about some of his other music? I, like I said, I have other pieces that are um, up on the website. There is a piece for soprano and altos with a soloist with piano. He was a pianist, so he knew how to write for the piano. Um, Don't Done Paid My Vow to the Lord is up there. And in like two months, I'll have another one of his pieces, uh, Trouble Don't Last Always. Uh, which is also for soprano, soprano, alto, and uh, piano. And and those are a lot easier. There's like, there are a couple low notes for the altos, but we all got at least one alto that can sing low. So you let that, that student or that singer just have fun with all of that. So hopefully this was a nice taste into the choral music of Art Nathaniel Dead. You could see a little bit of what he had to offer music, uh, which I feel... And I, you know, my bias doesn't have to be yours, even though my bias is right. No, I'm joking. Um, but his music is freaking fantastic. Needs to be performed by so many people. And I will gladly, gladly do, do whatever I can to promote his music. I see there's a question, but would you consider making an addition of We've Been Married? Oh, Priscilla, don't worry. Every piece, every choral piece by Arnold Daniel Dead will have an addition by Marcus L.A. Garrett by the time, in, within the next 15 years. So right now, um, I, like I said, I put up six pieces last year um, in October and November. Put two more pieces up there January 1st because those two went public domain this year. And there are still, I think, eight or 10 pieces that are public domain, but I just need to pace myself. So I don't want to saturate the choral market with all of the dead and people just forget about, about him. Um, and so it's just like every now and then I'm going to keep adding it. Um, I don't know when the Weeping Mary will be up there. But you don't need my permission to create. I mean, like, you have the score. Everything that I gave you is public domain. You can share that and perform it as often as you want. And you ain't got to pay anybody a dime for any of that stuff. Now, if you want specifically in my own edition, you got to wait. And I have it in my schedule. Who knows when? It'll probably be in the next five years. But don't quote me on it. So, yeah, more things will come of, of this. So, yeah. Does anybody have a question? I mean, I know it's like reading session time. But um, three-part arrangements, middle school. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not a middle school guru, so, um, you know, Brett, I don't know if you work in middle school, so if you do, go ahead, just do that, and then send it to me. I would love to, like, take a look at it and that kind of stuff. I've got some stuff with a few publishers also, so if you do a three-part arrangement of one of his pieces, add piano to it, send me a recording and that kind of stuff, hey, I might be able to convince somebody to publish it. You never know. Um, Oh, and Brianne, thank you. Glad you enjoyed it, even as you were driving. Nice driving music. <laughs> Dr. I'm done. If anybody else has any more questions, we could, we could take them. But I want to sincerely thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us tonight and sharing this incredible music with us. This is literally only the tip of the iceberg of Dr. Nathaniel Dett's music and your work on his music as well. Um, as you pointed out, I didn't mention any of the... Uh, uh, where you work or where you went to school or anything, but uh, Dr. Garrett is a professor at University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska, and is originally from uh, Hampton, Virginia. And uh, we know each other from Florida State University. But I, I'll say here that Dr. Garrett is an incredible composer himself. So when you check out mlagmusic.com, please take a look at his com- compositions as well. You have a very fine treble chorus, uh, soprano alto voices. He has a nice setting called Invitation to Love, a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar that is stirring and beautiful, and many, many other arrangements for various voicings. And so thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you didn't get a copy of the, um, or the link to um, 
to Dr. Garrett's um, program tonight, uh, his PDFs and, and additions and information. It is chock full of more information than he mentioned tonight. Check out NHACDA website, nhacda.weebly.com. Um, and it has many other um, resources for um, anti-racist um, teaching and pedagogy and, um, and, and other things. We'd love to see, to see you visit the website. So thank you so much for sharing this music with us. It's been a great blessing and I hope to hear uh, much, much more of this music being programmed uh, across New England. And thank you for letting me come back to New Hampshire. You know, even virtually, I appreciate that. And I look forward to um, hopping on a plane and being able to finally meet my goddaughter, you know, when it's time for her to be baptized and everything. I'm really looking forward to that. That's just a very personal thing. It has nothing to do with our Nathaniel death. I just love Alex and I love his family, so. Wow, we love <laughs> you too. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, happy Friday. Thank you so much. Enjoy your, uh, the birthday dinner, Marcus. Will do, will do. Thank yeah. You.